Welcome to this educational series at Animal Surgical Center of Michigan. We're going to discuss parathyroid tumors in dogs and cats. By far, we see a lot more dogs with this condition, but we on and off do see cats that also have parathyroid tumors. In regards to surgical anatomy, we have this area that is of interest showing the parathyroid glands. There are four parathyroid glands and they are closely associated with this brown structure called the thyroid gland. Dogs have a thyroid gland both on the left and right sides of the neck adjacent to this structure which is the windpipe and also closely associated with this very large vessel called the carotid artery which has a vagosympathetic nerve within its sheath. Along the side of the trachea or windpipe, there is a nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is very important in function of the voice box or the larynx. Dogs that have paralysis of this nerve on both sides will have breathing difficulties. In regards to calcium metabolism, we need to understand a bit about what's going on to understand what's going on with a parathyroid tumor because in this disease we get abnormalities associated with calcium metabolism. What happens is a tumor or growth develops within a parathyroid gland and this growth produces parathyroid hormone in excessive amounts. As a result, the calcium in the bloodstream increases much higher than normal. Parathyroid hormone will cause the bones to resorb calcium from the bone. Bone is rich in calcium. At the level of the kidneys, it causes resorption of calcium that normally would be excreted in the urine by the kidney to be resorbed back into the bloodstream. In regards to the intestines, it causes the intestinal cells to open up the calcium channels. So calcium is drawn in from the food into the bloodstream. All three of these things are affected to increase calcium when we have a dysfunctional parathyroid gland caused by a tumor. So you came to us because your pet has been diagnosed with hypercalcemia due to primary hyperparathyroidism, which is too much parathyroid hormone is being produced, resulting in excessive calcium in the bloodstream. The most common cause is a benign tumor called an adenoma of the parathyroid gland, and surgery in these cases is usually curative. It is a good condition to have from the perspective of curative surgery. The second kind of condition that we see that causes a parathyroid gland to produce too much hormone is called parathyroid gland hyperplasia. Sometimes these patients that have parathyroid gland hyperplasia can have multiple glands affected at the same time. Sometimes it's only one gland that's affected we remove the one gland and months to maybe a year later, the dog is or cat is hypercalcemic again. And that's the problem with this condition is the problem can come back again, but we really don't know if your patient, your pet has a parathyroid adenoma or parathyroid gland hyperplasia until it's removed. The sample is sent into the lab and we have the diagnosis. Thankfully, the lion's share of these cases have parathyroid gland tumors, parathyroid gland adenoma, and that is good news. Occasionally, we will see a patient that has a parathyroid gland carcinoma, which is a malignant tumor. Usually, these still do not spread. Surgery is usually curative, but there's always that possibility it could spread and recurrence of the hypercalcemia can result, or the patient just does not normalize the calcium um, postoperatively, even though you remove the parathyroid gland tumor. And that's because the metastatic disease or spread of the tumor is also producing parathyroid hormone.
but this is very unusual. Clinical signs of hypercalcemia from the perspective of the pet owner may include polydipsia, which is the patient is drinking too much. As a result of drinking too much, they have polyuria, which means they have too much production of urine. They pee a lot. Anorexia, lethargy, depression. In regards to urination signs, sometimes a patient can have signs that look like a bladder infection, blood in the urine, uh, frequent urination, and this is because they've developed stones in the bladder. Some dogs or cats with milder hypercalcemia may be asymptomatic, so you may not see anything other than blood work shows the abnormality, and we still should not ignore it because with time, we can develop issues associated with the hypercalcemia affecting other organs. Constipation, weakness, shivering, twitching, vomiting, stiff gait, meaning the dog walks stiffly. Swelling of the face, face is also reported but is less common. Why should we remove a parathyroid tumor once it's diagnosed? It is because hypercalcemia can affect multiple organs. It can cause damage to the kidneys. It can lead to stones. It can affect the cardiovascular system, the nervous system. Hypercalcemia can make the patient not feel well. In regards to the parathyroid tumors, they're usually pretty small when we diagnose them. They're usually anywhere from three to eight millimeters in diameter. And they're usually only in one of the glands. Remember, we have four parathyroid glands in animals in the normal situation. And only one is affected. So if we remove one, we still have three other parathyroid glands which will uh, function for maintaining normal calcium. What we're going to describe today is the minimally invasive parathyroidectomy in a dog. And what we're going to do is have the patient positioned on the operating table. We're then going to go ahead and ultrasound the neck to identify the specific location of the parathyroid tumor. On the screen, you can see the carotid artery, which is the black circle. To the left of it, is the strap muscle and the trachea. As we move caudally on the neck, we can see this black circle that comes in. That is the parathyroid tumor. What we're then going to do is take a skin stapler and keep the uh, probe in position and place a skin staple at that spot. We have our skin staple placed, and we're going to utilize that as a guide for where we're going to make an incision. We're going to make the incision, of course, on the left side because that's where the tumor is. But we usually put the staple just adjacent to where the midsection of the probe is. In the surgery, what we do is we are going to do this pre-surgical planning so we know exactly where that tumor is on the neck, whether it's on the left or right side. The tumor can be anywhere along this area of the neck. The traditional method of removal is a fairly substantial incision, roughly anywhere from four or five inches. The strap muscles are separated and both glands are evaluated to see whether or not we have a tumor. With ultrasound guidance, we can specifically identify where the tumor is. As a result, we make a fairly small incision. This is what a parathyroid tumor would look like. This is a long section of a parathyroid gland. You can see the parathyroid parathyroid tumor right here. We have surrounding thyroid tissue. In this other case, this is a kitty cat. We have the parathyroid tumor. 
and this is the thyroid right here. With a minimally invasive procedure, we make roughly a one inch incision. Do, do not need to make any larger of an incision than what you're seeing here. And then we remove this uh, mass. The incision, instead of being on the midline, is made off to the side where the tumor is. We separate the strap muscles uh, and get directly at the level of the tumor. This is less pain for the patient and uh, um, less, uh, uh, less invasiveness of the procedure. And uh, the patients have, have uh, a very quick recovery from this. And the main thing that we have to watch out for is the hypocalcemia in the postoperative period. Here again, you can see the incision, very small incision that's made alongside of the windpipe. This is the windpipe or the trachea. And it is a very good way to remove these tumors. We've been doing this for a number of years, have excellent success with this, and the patients typically are able to leave the hospital on the same day that they have the parathyroidectomy. Unless the patient has bladder stones, then the patient would stay overnight if we have a cystotomy or opening of the bladder surgery also performed at the same time. The incision is infiltrated with a product called Noceta. Noceta is a local anesthetic that is injected into the tissues and it numbs the area up. And I find that these patients actually don't even need any anesthetic or analgesic, pardon me, in the postoperative period. Uh, because of the use of Noceta. Pain will be minimal from the minimally invasive surgery. We need to monitor the incision for signs of infection. We must not allow the pet to scratch the neck. We either can bandage or use a scarf wrapped around the area if we find that the pet is scratching at the area. Want to offer your pet fresh water and the regular diet. We can go on regular walks. And we must watch the pet for hypocalcemia. This is the most important thing in the post-operative period that you will do. Dogs that have a total calcium greater than 14 milligrams per deciliter on their chemistry prior to surgery are prone to develop hypocalcemia post-operatively. Why is that? It is because the remaining three parathyroid glands are sleeping. They go into a dormant state. They do not produce parathyroid hormone. Eventually, these parathyroid glands will wake up in almost all cases. I say almost all because sometimes we found that we have a patient in which the parathyroid never wakes up again and the patient needs to be on a very low dose of calcitriol to maintain normal calcium levels. The signs that the pet owner needs to watch for in the postoperative period for hypocalcemia include rubbing the face against objects. This is seen in the dogs. In cats, it's twitching of the ears. These are early signs. And you might think, oh, the dog's just itchy. No, this is a sign of hypocalcemia, and this could lead down the pathway to major seizuring and death of your pet. Be very cognizant of the subtle clinical signs. Dogs will rub their face on the carpet. They'll rub their face on the sofa. They'll rub their face on you, so be aware of that. In the cat, it looks like they're trying to flick a, a fly off their ear. So be aware of that. And these are just little muscle spasms that they have, little muscle twitches. You may see loss of coordination, loss of control of or the body movement, stiff gait, unusual changes in their behavior, weakness, listlessness, fever, vomiting, panting, loss of appetite, convulsions. So you can have some signs that are pretty subtle and some signs that are more obvious, and so you do need to be careful of this. 
we utilize a medication preemptively in our patients that we do parathyroidectomies called calcitriol. Calcitriol is a fast-acting vitamin D analog. It will increase the calcium in the bloodstream. Most of the time, this medication is sufficient alone. You can also add on the calcium carbonate, which is your uh, Tums. And uh, uh, the Tums is the source of calcium, but the calcium calcitriol usually works alone by pulling the calcium out of the blood, pulling the calcium out of the urine as it goes through the kidneys. And in cases in which we're getting clinical signs that are pretty significant, you want to make sure you get to the local ER center to have your pet promptly treated. And what is generally done is an IV catheter is placed, calcium gluconate is administered through the IV to bring your pet out of this state of hypocalcemia because it can be life-threatening. Keep that ER facility number handy. You need to follow up with the ER facility uh, if you are seeing these clinical signs. Some surgeons choose not to uh, prophylactically put the patients on calcitriol in the post-operative period. These veterinary centers will hospitalize the patients for four or five days after surgery, do multiple ionized calcium levels on the blood in the post-operative period. Nothing wrong with it. It usually just means that the patient is going to A, stay in the hospital a lot longer, and B, it uh, means your pocketbook is going to um, be affected uh, quite a bit uh, more by this type of uh, intensive care. At our surgical center, we perform the parathyroidectomy on an outpatient basis and prescribe the medication prophylactically in all these patients. It is a very safe medication. We dose the patient at 20 nanograms per kilogram once a day at bedtime. On an empty stomach, it is absorbed better on an empty stomach, and we gradually wean these patients off the calcium or off the calcitriol. Uh, based on calcium blood testing that your primary care vet will do. Let's talk a little bit about calcitriol. It is a vitamin D analog that is very fast acting. It increases the absorption of calcium from food in the intestine, increases the absorption of calcium from the kidneys, releases calcium from the bones. It is best absorbed when given on an empty stomach. We typically recommend to give this at bedtime. We uh, recommend to have it compounded in a liquid and that allows us to slowly um, reduce the dose of this medication as time goes on. We can titrate it very accurately versus giving the capsules which are one fixed amount. You cannot break these capsules open. They're gel caps. They have a liquid in them. So you need to have it compounded for uh, a very easy transition in the post-operative period. Recheck evaluations are typically completed by your primary care veterinarian. We typically have you go around day three, sometimes day two after surgery, have that calcium level measured. You are to report that calcium level to the surgeon who has operated on your pet via text message or email, and he or she will then adjust the calcitriol dose at that time. Your primary care veterinarian will check the incision during the blood draws to ensure that the healing is taking place in an appropriate manner. Complications in the post-operative period may include hypocalcemia. We covered that in detail because that is your most serious and most common type of complication. The neck is a very sensitive area to be clipped and dogs can develop a clipper irritation or so-called clipper burn. If this does happen, a wonderful product called genomycin combined with beta-methasone valerate is wonderful. A spray of that three times a day will just take that clipper burn away. Um, it can, this can be obtained through your regular vet or through Chewy.com or allyvet.com, any of these online pharmacies have this. Infection is extremely rare. Incision opening up from the dog or cat scratching 
obsessively at the neck area and scratching the incision open, death due to hypocalcemia, unilateral laryngeal paralysis, remember the recurrent laryngeal nerve runs along the side of the trachea, very unusual that we have this kind of complication. In preparation for the surgery, we would like you to fill out the patient client information form that is on this web page, fill out the history form with a questionnaire that is on it, email that in to us, then obtain a treatment plan for one of our ASCM professionals. We'll give you an estimated fee of the surgery. Our assumption with that uh, treatment plan with the estimated fees on it is that we're going to have an uncomplicated recovery. We will give you fasting instructions. We put these patients on Pepsid AC prior to surgery uh, the morning of the procedure just to cut the acid in the stomach and minimize hot heartburn in the postoperative period. And the other thing we'll want to take care of is we'll get a prescription filled for you for calcitriol. And this needs to be compounded. We use Delcoma Pharmacy. They're amazing. They do send the medication uh, commonly uh, within a day or two to your home. They will call you for your credit card number and they will then um, get that medication shipped out to you promptly. If you are in their delivery zone, you'll get your medication that afternoon as um, the prescription is called in. Thank you very much. Feel free to give us a call. Get your pet scheduled in for a parathyroidectomy by one of our skilled veterinary board-certified surgeons.